Hello, everyone. This is number seven in my new series on Bible prophecy. And remember, it's interpretations of Bible prophecy through the ages. So from ancient into our own time. So what I'm intending to do here is to track and try to understand the various ways these texts have been understood as we move on through history. And they have been very powerful and very influential as they continue to be to this day. So, so in this seventh episode, I want to finish up the book of Daniel, a little bit of summary, but mainly drawing all the strands together and talking about some implications. How do the prophecies of the book of Daniel that definitely come from the ancient world over 2,000 years ago, no matter when you date it, how do they get stretched and used and reused and reappropriated all the way down to our time and what's going on in those texts? So I've done four episodes so far. This will be the fifth on Daniel, and I want to kind of finish it up. Now, the reason I chose Daniel to start with is because it is very much, in my view, the most influential prophecy in the Bible, whether you're talking about the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. All the other texts that you might consider very major dominant prophetic texts tend to be derivatives of Daniel. I'm thinking of books like Second Esdras, that's in the Apocrypha, but it was part of the Old Testament in the earliest forms of Greek Christianity, at least. And then the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament, very well known, very much takes the prophecies of Daniel and recast them into the second half of the first century CE of our own period, the Roman period, with Caligula and Nero and Titus and Vespasian and Domitian and some of those emperors that close out the first century. That's where the book of Revelation actually belongs, and we'll get to the book of Revelation. But it's essentially an extension of the book of Daniel. So let's begin and dive into uh, our fifth episode on Daniel. I'll share my screen here, and I've got some slides as usual. Let me center this up a little bit. There we go. Now, I'm calling this episode and this segment Inventing the Antichrist. And please note that I'm putting Antichrist in scare quotes because as it develops the idea I'm talking about, which I would define more as a final evil ruler that persecutes the people of God and does horrible things right before the end of the age, okay? So for short, the word antichrist is the one that is often used in our culture. And then my subtitle is The Origins of the Most Influential Myth in Bible Prophecy. That is, where did it come from? Well, clearly it comes from the book of Daniel. As you go through the book of Daniel, there's no question that chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 and 10, 11, and 12 all talk about a final evil ruler who historically can be identified as a Greek Macedonian ruler, a successor of Alexander the Great, Antiochus IV, also called Antiochus Epiphanes. So we've gone through that in some detail. He's called the Little Horn in chapter 7, and also in chapter 8, some people try to make a difference, but if you take a look at it, it all traces down to this single figure and what he did. Now, last time we were working in chapter 11 that you can see here on the screen, and I pointed out that when you get to verse 35, uh, you get this interesting phrase that I underline, until the time of the end, for it is yet for the time appointed. So that's the way prophecy often adds more time to something. In other words, it's kind of like a pause or a breather. And if you go back and read what it's talking about, this absolutely is Antiochus Epiphanes. And what it says 
is that he, through his forces, will appear and profane the temple in Jerusalem and the fortress and take away the continual burnt offering that was done twice a day, evening and morning, as we saw in chapter 8. And they, this evil ruler, will set up the abomination that makes desolate. Now, this gets picked up again and again and again. And we know this is Antiochus Epiphanes. And it goes on to talk about how some will be seduced by him. Again, I've said for the last few programs, read the first four chapters of First Maccabees. Get a copy of the Apocrypha. You can just go online and put it into the internet, First Maccabees, and you can read it. Read the first four or five, six chapters. And you'll see this vividly described. And the term desolating sacrilege, taking away the burnt offering, everything is in that book. And that was written around the time of Antiochus shortly after, celebrating the victory over him. And then it talks about those who are wise among the people, the righteous, uh, they'll be persecuted and they'll fall by the sword and flame in captivity, but they'll receive help. And then it says until the time of the end. So it kind of breaks off. It doesn't tell you that the Maccabees defeated Antiochus Epiphanes. There's a family called Maccabee, and they become what are known as the Hashmoneans. And not only did they defeat Antiochus Epiphanes, they literally set up an independent Jewish state for the first time since the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. They had their own high priests and they sanctified the temple after the defilement and it was a great victory. It's called Hanukkah today, it's still celebrated. And for you that are Christians, you might remember in John chapter 10, Jesus is down in Jerusalem walking around in the temple on Hanukkah. And he certainly knew all of these stories, and they were important all through Jewish history after the time when we're passed on in this way. So you have a break. So I drew a line here, and then I put an asterisk. Because as you read, and this is true all the way through chapter 11, there's a king of the north and a king of the south. But the identity of these kings, north and south, changes as one ruler of their dynasty or regime is replaced by another. So when it says the king shall do according to his will, you've got a couple possibilities here. One is that the writer expects Antiochus to win. And this is a very, very devastating description of what he's going to do. But when you read it, I personally am not convinced that it fits Antiochus very well. Now, most critical scholars would disagree. They would say that everything from 36 down to 39 is still Antiochus. It sounds a little overblown, but it's still him. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is when the time of the end didn't come with Antiochus Epiphanes, that someone predicted, well, he can't be the final evil ruler then. And therefore, there has to be another one. And that's what I mean by inventing the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist, no matter where he's put throughout history, is an antitype or a successor of the figure of Antiochus Epiphanes. In other words, a final evil ruler. So why is it a problem for the end not to come with Antiochus Epiphanes? It's a problem because in the other previous visions, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and, and this one right up through these verses, you're clearly talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. There's no mistaking that and what he did. Now, whether he'll have a successor, that's another thing. But the point is, in chapter 7, what happens when the little horn begins to stomp and persecute and wear out the saints and try to basically abolish their religion. And he's a little horn, a mouth speaking great things. Remember chapter seven? And this is how he's described again here. So it's sort of a reappropriation of the image. But what happens? Well, he's completely destroyed by the son of man coming in the clouds, which is interpreted as the people of God. 
overthrowing him. And what happens in chapter eight? The indignation runs its course after 1150 days or 2300 morning and evening sacrifices. And we know that's essentially what happened under the Maccabees. Uh, Antiochus was able to defile the temple and set up an altar to Zeus, the Greek god, and basically abolish Judaism and its practices as much as was possible. And it caused a big revolt. But finally, the Jews won with a military victory. So it seems like there has to be a pause. And then what happens in chapter 9? A 490-year period. And at the end of that period, there's no gaps in it. The final seven years of that period, you get this prince who is to come who destroys the city and the sanctuary. And that's exactly what Antiochus Epiphanes did. So each of those three prophecies ends with Antiochus Epiphanes and then the people of God taking over and setting up the kingdom. But the description of the kingdom doesn't sound like the Maccabees, who are basically Hellenized Jews that took on Greek customs and Greek names. And even though they were very nationalistic, they also had a lot of relationships with Rome and with other Gentile countries and all kinds of negotiations with the Parthians and with the Romans and with the Greeks and so forth. So what do we have here? Well, let's read it. The king shall do according to his will. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and will speak astonishing things against the god of gods. Well, I don't know if that applies to Antiochus Epiphanes. He comes into the Holy Land with the idea in mind of basically abolishing Judaism and trying to transform it into the worship of the Greek gods and the Greek deities. It goes on to say, he will give no heed to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. And that could even mean that he himself is not one who loves women. So notice he will prosper until the indignation is accomplished. Well, the indignation is spoken of repeatedly in these prophecies as the filling up of the sins of the Gentiles so that God would intervene. But God didn't intervene after Antiochus Epiphanes as far as setting up the kingdom of God, and certainly not anywhere near that period. Then it goes on to say, he will give no heed to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. There are various interpretations of this, but the overall meaning is that he's going to declare himself to be God. He shall not give heed to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And so that also doesn't seem to fit Antiochus. He'll honor the God of fortresses. We're not sure what all of these things mean. A God whom his fathers did not know. Maybe it even means just it's it's related to the word Masada. Uh, the idea that you honor power and military power. He honors himself. He will deal with the strongest fortresses and by the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he will magnify with honor and make them rulers over many and divide the land for a price. So is this Antiochus Epiphanes described in kind of a fairly extreme way? But when you get to verse 40, it does for sure seem to switch. The king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north will rush upon him. And all of these things that are described right down through verse 45 do not seem to apply very easily to Antiochus Epiphanes. But they could be read to apply to the entrance of Roman power into the Holy Land, whether it's Pompey or even finally Octavian, because we're going to see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's applied even to the later period. So whoever wrote these final chapters, the end of 11 and 12, I think is trying to go beyond Antiochus Epiphanes. So it's easy to see how interpreters all the way through time would get stuck here 
read on down through 12 where you have the great tribulation and the resurrection of the dead and they would say this is all going to happen again at the end of the age and i call that inventing the antichrist so what you have now is a floating prophecy uh, let me give you some examples of how it was applied the very first time as far as i can find here we have a little fragment of a dead sea scroll as you can see, it breaks off here, and part of it's missing. It's cataloged as K4 Qumran. Qumran's where the scrolls were found in and around that ancient ruin, and it's numbered 246. Sometimes it's called the Son of God text. So let's take a look at it. It's very interesting. Here we have an interpretation. We think this dates to the end of the first century BCE. So they're looking at that Roman period with the invasion of Rome, with Pompey, with Octavian, but none of them really went into the temple and defiled it in the extreme way that's described in the prophecies. For example, Pompey did besiege the city. There's no question about that. We have a vivid description in great detail in Josephus and other historians of the time. But even after going into the Holy of Holies and certainly defiling it by his Gentile presence and his military presence, he doesn't offer a pig on the altar. He doesn't set up a statue of Zeus. He doesn't stop Jewish worship. He doesn't fulfill any of the things that Antiochus did. And so if you're gonna have a final evil figure Worse than Antiochus, who declares himself to be God, it doesn't seem to fit him. Some have argued Octavian because he did call himself the son of God. And you're going to see in this text, the one who is to come, the evil ruler, is going to call himself the son of the Most High God. Now, this text is very disputed. There are several interpretations, it's just a fragment, so we can't be sure. But I have pretty strong opinions that it's about the so-called final evil ruler, the Antichrist, as people call him. But others argue that this is actually the good Messiah, the Messiah of the Jews. And Christians were very thrilled by this fragment because the phrase, he will be called the son of the Most High God, is actually a phrase that occurs in the book of Luke chapter 1, where Jesus is said to be one who will be called the son of the most high God. So there is great excitement over this text. Not that it prophesied Jesus, but that it had a Christology or view of the Messiah or Christ as a son of God in a very similar way that you can find in some parts of the New Testament. However, David Flusser, quite a few others, I think have argued very persuasively that it's talking about the coming of a final evil ruler. The group is writing this based on their interpretations of the book of Daniel. You can see the references to Daniel here that are in parentheses. They're allusions, not exact quotations. So let's read it. Um, if you see something in brackets, we can't be sure if it's exactly that word or that phrase, but usually if you have enough letters, you can. The Spirit of God dwelt on him. He fell down before the throne. This is probably Daniel. And he's giving the king a revelation. O king, you are angry forever and your years, and then it's like blank, 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 your vision and all. So a lot of times you can't get complete sentences. Forever you, something about blank, the great ones. And then it gets a little more clear. An oppression will come to the earth a great massacre in the provinces, and he will be great on earth and will make and all will serve. So it sounds like he's going to make everybody serve him. Now, keep reading. And he will be called, or it can be translated call himself, maybe grand, but we only have just a bit of that. And by his name, he will be designated. The Son of God, he will be proclaimed, or it could be proclaim himself, and the Son of the Most High, they will call him. Like the sparks of wisdom, so will be their kingdom. 
they will reign for years on earth and they will trample all. So some have said this is the Jewish Messiah, the good guy. I think it's the bad guy. He's going to be called the son of the most high, or even better, he's going to proclaim himself as the son of the most high. And that sounds like it would come then more out of Daniel. And then they're going to trample. People will trample people. Jesus even quotes a version of this, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people trampling people, one province trampling another province, until the people of God will arise and all will rest from the sword. So that's the kingdom, final evil ruler, kingdom of God. There, the people of God, their kingdom will be an eternal kingdom, Daniel 7, 27. This is exactly parallel to what we've seen, the pattern in the book of Daniel. Chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 11. In all their path will be truth. They will judge the earth in truth, and all will make peace. The sword will cease from the earth, and so forth. The great God is their helper. He'll wage war for them. So this is the war of the people of God. They take over everything. Their dominion will be eternal dominion and all the boundaries and so forth. So again, this is a Dead Sea Scroll based on the book of Daniel very clearly. And what is it saying? That this final guy will be called the son of the most high or call himself the son of the most high and will trample people in province after province until the people of God come and take over. So I think it's basically just what we call a kind of a commentary or midrash on the book of Daniel. Now, if we go to the next one, this is another Dead Sea Scroll. It was in Cave 1, Qumran, and it comes from the word war. So Milchama, the idea of a war. The king of the Ketim shall enter into Egypt. So you're reading again, Daniel 11. And in his time, he will set out in great wrath to wage war against the kings of the north, that his fury may destroy and cut the horn of Israel. This shall be a time of salvation for the people of God. So whenever the Ketim invade, and everyone now is agreeing, we first thought years ago when the scrolls were found that Ketim is the Maccabees, but we now know by many, many passages that it is the Romans. And then comes, he's going to try to cut off the horn of Israel, and there will be a time of salvation for the people of God and dominion for all the co-members of his company, and everlasting destruction. And look, the sons of righteousness shall shine over the ends of the earth. We just see that in Daniel 12. So this is another attempt to interpret Daniel 11, those last verses, especially from verse 40 on, and what's going to happen. And they're predicting it as well, but they're now moving it on to Rome. So this is what happens. What we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have several times where Daniel's reference. This is the time of which it is written in the book of Daniel. The wicked will do wickedly and will not understand, but the righteous shall purify themselves and make themselves white. Daniel 12, verse 10. And so as they're reading these texts, probably in the late first century BCE, they think they're going to live to see the end. I already mentioned in my second episode that I called the first Messiah, how they understood this whole period. So what they've done is they've moved the fourth kingdom to Rome so that now the final evil ruler will come from Rome. And that's going to slide right on into the first century CE as well. So we've got Pompey conquering Jerusalem and you have this rivalry between the two sons of Salome Alexandra, these priests, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus. And at first, Pompey favors Aristobulus, but then Aristobulus doesn't really surrender to the city. Hyrcanus holds out, and he tries to get help from the Parthians. There's a three-month siege. It is very bloody, and it is very much of a destruction, but he doesn't tear the temple and the city down like the Romans did in the summer of 70. He enters the Holy of Holies, but then he lets it be restored. And then the end doesn't come. The kingdom of God doesn't come. The people of God don't take over. In fact, the Romans put a secure rule 
over the whole land of Israel for the next few hundred years. And even when Rome is Christianized, they essentially are still controlling the Holy Land all the way down Constantine and his uh, successors. So in 41, Caligula's attempt to put his statue in the temple must have caused mass hysteria. If you don't know that story, we're going to cover it later when we get to the first century. What I'm talking about now is how you slide the ruler, remember, on down. So you've got your four kingdoms ending with Alexander the Great and his successors, and then you move it on down. And the point is now the fourth kingdom is Rome. So all you, I'll go back and show you how that works in just a second uh, with our, our chart on the four kingdoms. Uh, but Caligula was stopped from doing that. Uh, he actually wanted the Jews to worship him, and he was completely lost his mind, basically. Crazy, as we say. But he was stopped by his own Praetorian guard, and he was assassinated. Remember when Paul in 2 Thessalonians talked about the man of sin sitting in the temple of God and claiming he is God, he's probably lived through Caligula's attempt and then he says, what is now working will continue to work, meaning, yeah, that wasn't it, but that was close. So everybody thinks it's going to come. And then 70 AD, Titus and Vespasian, preterists today would say, well, what are you waiting on? This is it. I mean, everything's fulfilled in the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And I will cover that interpretation later. What I'm trying to show here is that Jewish communities living in the late first century BC into the first century AD knew they were clear from Daniel 9 because of the 490 year clock ticking. So all that you have to do is change the time when the clock starts counting the 490 year period. Since we've got various rulers coming along that might be candidates for this role of the final evil ruler, the Antichrist, as he later gets called. Uh, you just go from Nebuchadnezzar's time and Cyrus declaring rebuild Jerusalem, 539, and just move it on down, move it on down. And finally, you can even make it fit the time of Jesus or even later. Now, if we go all the way back, I could just take this cursor and move us all the way back to our first vision of the four coming kingdoms. Um, here we've got the labels that initially would be given. Nebuchadnezzar, so Babylon, Persia, Greece, Alexander, and the successors of Alexander culminating in Antiochus IV. So that would be basically what's covered in Daniel chapter 11. So he would be, uh, he comes from Alexander, but he'd be a kind of a fourth kingdom. Well, it's really easy to move this back up here and have it at Alexander culminating in Antiochus and then a Roman empire. But if you're going to move to Rome, a fourth kingdom being Rome, which they do in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which the early Christians certainly think, which Jesus certainly thought, I think, from anything I can figure out, especially if you go by Mark chapter 13, where he gives his apocalypse, if that does go back to him in any way, uh, certainly it goes back to his followers and interpreters. They think it's Rome. But where you're going to have trouble is when you have the other prophecies that also give the four kingdoms, or they trace things down to Antiochus, and then there's no gap, and then they say, well, the end will come and God will come and defeat this evil ruler. So what's happening in chapter 11, I think, is there's some wiggle room. There's some time that you've added so that you can possibly end up with it fitting uh, any future time. So it basically opens things up. Now, just to end in a kind of interesting way, I'm going to go back a page. This is Daniel 11, right before this right here, okay? So if we go down here to verse 21, where we get a shift, in his place, this is a king of the north, one of the many kings of the north that have been traced here, 
will arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. And he'll come in without warning and so forth. And this goes all the way down and describes, most scholars agree, Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, early Christians, for example, I was reading Jerome's commentary on this, and he thinks this is already the final figure, not Antiochus, or it's Antiochus, but a kind of a double repeat of it that the new guy that finally comes, the later guy, the final guy, will do this all again. So let me share something with you in closing that is just a kind of a little extra thing from my own experience. If you go in chapter 11 to verse 20, which everybody agrees is Antiochus Epiphanes, but you do think that it has a kind of a double application and it could apply to the end, then some interesting things emerge. And I think the question most people would have, but how could you make all of this fit again, somebody else, because it's just so specific and it seems to fit Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 to 164 BCE. So what are you doing? Well, when I was dealing with Waco and David Koresh in 1993, it was right after the first Gulf War. And there had been the World Trade Center bombing also in 1993 at the same time as the Waco siege. So David Koresh, I learned later, I didn't get this directly from him, but I got it from some of his tapes and then interviewing his followers. Some of you might know I was involved in that in working with the FBI and trying to help them understand his worldview because he was totally under these prophecies. He read this as the first Gulf War, not Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, when you first hear that, you think, well, that's really crazy. Well, now it is because the first Gulf War is long over and Saddam Hussein didn't amount to much at all after his initial attack on Kuwait. But what if you start here, in his place, the Ba'ath Party, shall arise a contemptible person on whom royal majesty has not been given. If you remember, Saddam came in and he wasn't part of the previous rulers. He was a nobody, but he got military power with a small party. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken. And from the time an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. Without warning, he will come into the richest parts. And if you look at the footnote, it says, among the richest men. Who are the richest men in the world? Maybe Kuwait? In the richest parts of the province? And he will do what neither his fathers nor his fathers' fathers have done scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods, and he will devise plans against strongholds, and he will stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south, that's the United States and all the southern allies based in Egypt coming up from the south. You see how he could convince people, this is it, the end is near, which he thought. He didn't think it was 93, but he thought it was going to be in 1995, and he thought the Gulf War was the beginning of it. And remember, Saddam was still in power. He wasn't deposed, as you know, until the second Gulf War. So he will stir up his power. The King of the South comes with a great and mighty army. That was an unbelievable coalition that George Bush Sr. put together. But he will not stand, for plots will be devised against him. And then it says people will try to poison him. Many will fall slain. But the two kings bent on mischief will speak lies at the same table. Do you remember General Schwarzkopf? If you were living at that time, maybe you've learned or read about it. And they made a peace agreement. And David Koresh said, you know, what's a peace agreement? It's two kings sitting at a table speaking lies to one another. Notice, but to no avail for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And then he will return to his land with great substance, but set his heart against the Holy Covenant. Remember during the Scud missile attacks, 
He said he's going to turn Tel Aviv into a crematorium and finish the work that Hitler started. So David Koresh didn't live to see the rest of this, uh, all the other things that were supposed to happen, but I just wanted to point that out. It's a good example of how people all through history can come into these verses and these chapters, and especially Daniel 11 and 12, because they're tightly packaged. Final evil ruler, terrible time of trouble for the world, resurrection of the dead, final judgment. Not a lot of gaps there. But since it didn't happen under Antiochus Epiphanes, you're left again with the problem of either relegate it to the files of ancient history with the hopes and dreams of the Jewish people for redemption that didn't come. And you can draw encouragement and believing that there'll be somehow a final victory over evil by those who are good or something of that nature, so-called spiritual interpretation. But the prophecy doesn't read like that. And who wants another final evil ruler? You know, people that believe this is still coming uh, it's like Hitler wasn't enough, even though he did so much that would fulfill some of these things. He obviously wasn't the one, and the end didn't come. In fact, the Allies were able to triumph after World War II. So that's Daniel. We're going to return to it many times because we're going to look at all of these interpretations as the time goes by. And I'm going to end there and get this up for everybody. And next time in number eight, I'm going to cover the main prophecies of the Davidic Messiah. What do they really say? You might think there are hundreds and hundreds. There aren't that many. I'm talking about something very specific. What is the Messiah supposed to do? And we'll look at that, and we'll ask the question, has any figure claiming to be the Messiah ever even come close to fulfilling any of the elements of those prophecies? You might be surprised, but we will take a good, straight look at those texts beginning next time. And it'll be a few episodes because we want to go in great depth. <music>